Hey everybody, Haas Drone here with another first edition Friday video. I got with me the flying Hawaiian, uh, Mr. Matt. He and I are together today. Uh, Matt reached out to me, wanted to uh, learn about how to get better at dilemmas and dilemma combos um, as the kind of ongoing effort with my coach Kevin uh, persona. I'm always willing to help anybody who reaches out and wants advice uh, on that kind of a topic within the game. So uh, how are you doing Matt? Doing great Kevin. Hey thanks for having me on. Hey not a problem. So um, go ahead and load a deck. You kind of had mentioned earlier that's what you were thinking about doing. You just want to load a deck and kind of go over it. That's kind of the way I've done it in the past with other people, my other kind of Coach Kevin acolytes. Um, you show me what it is that where you're at, and then that makes it easier as, as a good starting point then for us to then talk things out. Because the easiest way to learn about getting better at dilemmas is to kind of talk things out with some, you know, from a starting point. So go ahead and load a deck, and then just put the dilemmas out on the table. Um, in whatever fashion feels comfortable to you. If you want to do them in the combos or whatever, you can just set them out there. Hey, let me, uh, give me a second here. Let me, uh, let me find the one that I think I, I played against you back in, back in, uh, back in, in, uh, uh oh, I don't know if I have the right deck here. <laughs> Oops. Let me try this again. Uh, give, give me one second here. So right. I've also I've also loaded a random deck here. Um, there we go. Okay. This does not look like the deck that I played. Give me give me one second here. Can yeah, sure. Back? No worries. No worries. This video can go for as long or as short as we feel like we want to have it go. Excellent. And we can always talk about stuff in the meantime. Um, this was it. All right, I'm going to load this deck. This is the one, this is the deck that I played against when I was actually um, visiting some family. Okay, this so this is, this, is what you, this is what you brought to Minnesota here a month, month yeah. and a half ago. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's a great starting point. And then you want me just to reveal everything to you here? Uh, just go ahead and just throw the dilemmas down onto the table. Okay. Cool. Yeah. 18 dilemmas here. Right. And they, and they have just... Uh, So just go ahead. Let's just let's just get them organized then um, into the combos that you had them in. Okay. So let me see. I'm gonna zoom back out and I forgot to toss them all on the deck. Right. Is this all eighteen? I only see like ten of them on the board. All right, let me let me delete let me delete these. See if we, see if I can. I gotta reload the deck here for you. Okay, go ahead and reload it. Uh, off to off to off to an awesome Well, you know, Lackey's Lackey can be that way. Okay, here we go. Now I see there's 18 in your Dyson sphere. All right, well let me. I'll, I'll toss them out together. This is kind of how I look at what the thought process was. I had a couple of ego probes for space. Okay. And I had a uh, experienced binge. Binge. And then an explosive decompression. This was one, so you can counter the Edo Pro, the Beach, and then explosive decompression. Okay. And the reason that explosive decompression was there was because I had. Oh, you were running uh, six PNZs. Well, we'll, running, we'll, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll make that clear that it, there was a reason, and that is that your your deck was. Uh, control neutral zones all as a part of this deck. Right. Kind of like a, right. A little, a little fun thing there. Um, then it was an Edo Pro run into a, uh, a dead end, um, which I have somewhere in here, uh, I think. Right here. Uh, oh, okay, you found it, right? Yep. 
And then you did another uh, explosive behind it? Another explosive behind it. Okay. Yeah. So let's then, do this. Uh, um, I'm going to take all your, when you put them on the board, I'm just going to take them and flip yeah. them around. So, all right. yeah. Uh, then encounter a uh, misinterpreted history. This was a planet, uh, a forsaken, and a rules of obedience. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then a uh, buried alive, a space amoeba, and a god. Okay. A lack of preparation, higher than fewer, and a combo female's love interest diver scale. Okay, so it's a dual combo, yeah. got it. Yeah. Dominion disintegration protocol, M113 creature, and then a linguistic. Okay, so another dual combo there, okay. Yeah. Okay. That was, those were the combos. So it's basically two space, two planet, and two flex. Okay. Um, I, see, I see two space. Then I see the th three different flexes, and then the maybe it's three. Yeah, three flex. Yeah, you have three flexing. Um. Yeah. One flex. Okay, and then it was ending on this one was ending on the the, the garbage scowl. It was lack of prep into. The higher the, the fewer. Higher, the higher, yeah. yeah. And then you started with a median into the M113 into the linguistic, right? Yep, exactly. Okay. All right. So let's. All right. Let's, let's start with since we're going to. Let's start with what happened when we played our game, Matt, which is that you oh, put the buried okay. alive under Bajor. I then okay. walked through it because I had, not, I had the orb. That I acquired yeah. immediately. Um, yeah, just just so just so your viewers know, I think your first words to me were when I was playing against each other were, "This deck probably would have won worlds." <laughs> so, so, so I don't know, I don't know, Kevin. I, mean, I think you won in turn four. So yeah, I, I did win on yeah. turn four. Um, Head, heads up. Yeah. yeah. I, I won on turn four, Matt, because as you recall, the second thing that came out of the, the the first thing that came out of my mouth after I saw the buried alive was this is a mistake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but of course, so that being said, uh, the mission setup I have in that deck is to basically kind of encourage that sort of a thing. It's actually trying to encourage the opponent to either put their buried alive underneath Bajor if they have one, or to put it in a completely wrong place. So then it's not even a, a relevant problem for the deck. Um, so this is what I'm seeing here. Um, let's start. Let's start over here with the buried alive and the space we've been got. It's a fine combo. I don't have a problem with it. In our game, uh, you put it in the wrong place, and so let's. Let's start off by talking about, um, and I, I talked to Joe about this, I've talked to all my, my acolytes about this, uh, in particular my, my protege, Mark Mustin, my local player who I taught the game years ago, and he just continues to get better and better with every passing year. Um, and that is that there, I kind of have, like a, a, when it comes to the game, I, I kind of have some maxims, I have some kind of like, you know, Coach Kevin's you know, rules, right, um, about how I approach the game. It's obviously served me well. But when it comes to dilemmas, I have a couple of maxim and, maxims in particular. The first off, is, the first of those is, is that uh, don't ever be predictable, right? Mm -hmm. The moment your opponent um, can predict what it is that you're doing, they can craft away teams and crews and stuff like that. They just beat you, right? Like, you need your dilemmas to be able to hold up, and they only hold up if your opponent can't anticipate them, right? Yeah. It's part of the reason why I currently have a problem with the fact that they've been boosting and encouraging the use of, use of scan cards. Like, they brought scan and full planet scan back out into the wild, and, you know, and of course I abused orb experience at that tournament we played in, and... You know, as Chris found out, it's like his four-card combos don't do anything when I see the first three cards, you know, um, and can craft the perfect away team, right? Um, 
So the problem with Buried Alive into Space Movement into God is that while it is effective, it has one we that the first off its weaknesses is that um, if they randomly have an attribute boost to integrity, it's a total whiff. Not that that's a that's not a critical problem because of the fact that like any all good combos will have some kind of a weakness to it, right? There's always like you know when you know the 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 immovable object. In, 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 the immovable object that is your dilemma combo is beaten by the unstoppable force that is a perfect away team, right? Um, yeah. And so you don't have to, I mean, so I always tell my protégés, like, don't worry about your opponent, like, perfecting, like, you know, like, crafting the perfect away team or whatever, right? Because um, if you're unpredictable, that will be very hard to do. The problem is, is that when your opponent sees Buried Alive and then they get to, they, they, they get a free kick out, um, then the very first thing that they're thinking then is, um, is like, is it going to be a God combo or is it going to be a Cytherian's combo? Like all of a sudden the opponents become extremely cautious, right? So buried alive is a great dilemma in the meta. It's a great dilemma to use if you are, um, worried about a six planet deck or um, if you're playing like a battle deck and you want to force a planet to have a ship at it, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Your deck was neither of those things. Um, right. It was just beat solver. Right. Yeah. You're not, yeah. you're not worried about a six planet opponent because you yourself are running six space. And so like you're on even footing with your opponent. So that's maxim number two. Your dilemmas should pair to your deck. Always. Okay. Um, like, whatever dilemmas that you do, they should always have what your deck is in mind. And so, like, if you're playing a, a battle deck, you need to be playing dilemmas that maximize that. If you're playing a solver deck, you want to make sure that, like, if there's a... If there are other decks that beat your solver deck that you know about, then those are the decks that you want to shade your dilemma combos to being able to hurt, to try to, like, regain an equal footing on them. Okay? So, if you're playing a solver deck and you know that... Like, oh, Borg is going to hurt me, like, badly. Well, then the only way to beat that Borg deck would then be to make Dilemma combos that hurt Borg particularly hard so that if you can just get out in front of the Borg opponent, they may not catch up to you. Even if it goes to a timed game, they may not catch up to you. Okay? So that's, that's maxim number two, is your Dilemmas should always pair to your draw deck. You know, like, and if anything, like... I always do dilemmas last unless the deck I'm building is actually building off the dilemmas to start with. That's obviously not most decks. Most decks are, I want to build this deck because I want to do a certain thing. Um, and then you build your dilemmas around it, right? So, with yeah. your deck, with your deck, since your deck is a PNZ sol six-space solver, you know, like, your goal is to try to solve three PNZs quickly, right? And you have a very exactly. long, you're going to have like a very long space line in the alpha quadrant that your opponent's not going to get through. Because of that, my very first question is, is where the F is your Cytherians? Yeah. Yeah. Really good question. Okay. Yeah. So this should not be this combo. This should be uh, Buried Alive. Um, it should be Buried Alive into a Cytherians and... The, uh, at you know, at some point in the combo, whether the Cytherians is second or third, that depends on what it is that you want to do with it. My opinion is that because you are running like a solver deck that's going to kind of like you know trying to trying to leverage a mismatch against your opponent, um, is that you want to make opponents have to commit. And so what you want then is to either have is that you would strongly be leaning towards, I want to have something like a big qualifier in front of the Cytherians, because they're not getting through your PNZ in the Alpha Quadrant. If your opponent's in an off quadrant, that's a whole other problem, but, you know, you can't solve every problem, right, with a Dilemma right. Combo. Like, every Dilemma Combo has to encounter some reality in the game, right? Because um, if, if there were perfect Dilemma Combos, no one would get through them, and that would be a point of playing, right? So you have to you have to just accept the certain caveats in the game. So, um, so let's. So a good one is is this one, uh, Thasian powers. 
Um, it requires the opponent to um, provide a bunch of cunning, and if they don't, and, and the more cards they have in hand, then the more cunning that they need. So you're attacking the opponent in, in possibly two different ways. You're making them a, they're, you're making them put, you know, like at minimum five or six people into a crew to get through it, or five or six people onto a planet to get through it, because they'll get to choose which which direction it goes. If they put it all, if they put it towards the planet, all the people are on the planet. Then when the Scytherians hits the ship, then the ship can't um, ship can't move, but it cannot be part of the mission attempt either. So then they have to figure out like who do they want to sacrifice. They still lose that they lose that turn, right? If you were playing a battle deck, this is what I would recommend because then you're matching the fact that okay, they either have to have a lot of people out in the open on the planet, I can kill them there, or they have to put a lot of people on the ship and I can blow the ship up, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, since since you're running Buried Alive, my, my personal opinion is, is and this kind of goes back a long way, like before design, um, uh, before design, kind of refocus on these kind of dual missions, you know, by making Buried Alive and making more missions that are dual. Like it, there was like this long period of time in the game where like people didn't know how to attempt the mission and they certainly didn't know how to put dilemmas underneath it for maximum effect. What we kind of do now. Um, oops, I must have spelled it wrong. Persistent individuality. Oh my gosh. Oh, it's being. Huh. I apparently can't spell right now. Um, which which part? Uh, persistent individuality. I bet I'm spelling it with a with a individuality. Uh, P. No, I suck at it. Whatever. It's a P P R S I S T E N T. Yep. I N D I V I D U A L I T Y. Individ. Oh gosh, that's that's what it is. <laughs> Persistent individuality. Oh my gosh, Kevin! Wow. Okay, so then, so then my my answer to that has always been like, what you want to do is with a like a dual mission is you want to like really stress one side or the other. You want to just treat it like it's a space mission, or just treat it like it's a planet mission. Don't treat it like it's a dual. Don't treat it like it's a dual mission. Don't try to hit both. Or if you do try to hit both, you're using one to set the other up. So instead of it being like, oh, I want to go space amoeba into God, you go like persistent individuality into God, because they have to they have to like have like six seven people on the ship to beat the persistent individuality, and then they have to see the God coming. Yep. So they have to have the right people on the planet then to beat the God on top of the fact that you're having to stretch them in space. Right. Yeah. So then, so I would say this. I would be like, where do you want the Scytherians to be? Do you want the Scytherians to be part of actual space combos, or do you want the Scytherians to be in the Braid Alive combo, right? Since your deck is running six PNZs and you're not playing a battle deck, I would suggest that the Scytherians should be over here, and you could run this instead. But since, like I said, you're not running the battle deck, like, you don't need to be blowing their ships up. And and to be clear, that this, this deck did have a if necessary, so I do have like some okay. uh, incoming message federation, you know, attack, right. with, you know, with all of that. I had a bunch of Romulans in here. There's a right. Romulan thing. You could you could board only Romulans, for instance, on you know one of their big ships and, and blow it up. So there was there were the, 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 I don't know one or two games I won at that tournament. I mean, there right. was a little bit of ability in there, but it's not. I mean, maybe to your point, it's also. It's a flexible deck, but it's not necessarily either a straight speed solver or, but it's definitely not an attack deck. It's got <laughs> right. That option. You're, you're yeah. like, you're kind of a borderline mid range deck, right? There you go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if you accept that, if you accept the reality that you're playing kind of a borderline mid range deck, it, then it becomes a question of how do you want to balance the dilemmas? Do you want to shade the dilemmas more towards, I want to hurt specific decks that I'm going to lose to, or do I want to shade it more towards the mid range aspect of it? So that that mid-range equality of the deck can be leveraged. My opinion on that is that that's what you should be doing, but I also think that means 
changing the draw deck itself yep. to lean more into it. Um, if for that reason, then I would suggest you do this, and we put the Scytherians over here. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so then that kind of takes care of one combo then, right? That kind of makes one combo better for you, right? The problem I keep having with like people playing the Space and Eva into God combo here is that this dilemma is like doing nothing, right? Space and Eva ain't doing Space and Eva ain't doing anything, right? I mean, literally, all it does is reset. Re, it, all it does is reset their attributes, and yes, it makes God more likely. But you know, a properly set up God doesn't need Space and Eva to do it. And in a lot of ways, not telegraphing the God is the better way to go. Yeah. Right. And the moment you like, you know, like so, if you're gonna if you're gonna bury it alive, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna telegraph the possibility of God with a buried alive again, you have to be unpredictable if you want to succeed with your dilemmas. Is that okay? I'm gonna telegraph this a little bit, but your next decision is gonna really determine what happens here, because yeah. they have to be able to cover the persistent individuality and cover the God to go through. Whereas an opponent with the space amoeba into God will just be like, if it's space amoeba into, if, if, if it's a God combo, I'm going to just put everyone on the planet because then my ship blows up with hardly anyone on board. Right. Okay. If it's a, if it's a cloud, if they're setting up a cloud, again, I don't mind the ship being damaged. People are not on the ship. So if you want to have Buried Alive telegraphing you know, what it is that you're doing, then you need to make the opponent uncomfortable, right? So that's kind of max up number three. If you do, if you are a little predictable, then you need to be that much more strong about it. Then, then you need to like leverage that knowledge then back against your opponent, right? So like, you know, like you give them a little bit of rope to hang themselves with, right? Yep. So... That's why I would say that, like, this is the way to go for a deck like your, for the deck that you're playing, is that, like, okay, if you want to leverage that mid-range equality a little bit more, then you need to, then you need to, like, actually leverage that quality of, like, okay, I want to blow up ships, but I want to put stress on the people, too. Like, if, if, if they're, like, okay, I'm going to go with most of my people on the planet, one guy on the ship, fine, that dude dies and you're stopped. That buys me a turn and that guy's dead. And now you got to put everyone on the ship. So then, even if you beat the god, you know, because then what happens is then you got to start thinking, like, then there's the advanced level thinking where you're like, okay, this is the combo I'm running. Where is my best place for it? Well, if you're leveraging the mid-range aspect of your deck, this is the planet combo that goes closest to your side of the space line, period. Right. So that you can get to them. So they like, okay, they beat god, but they had to be there. They had to be there, you know, and then you could potentially just shoot them and, and, and make them hurt by them being so close to you, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Cool. Now, now let's move on to, and I like to, I like to work, I like to deal, and this is just a personal preference. Um, obviously, yeah. different decks are going to, like, you're going to, like, build out differently. But for the purposes of the fact that you're talking about a mid rangey deck here, we need to start with your planet and your space combos, and then we will work back into the duels, Okay. Okay, so keep that in mind as well. That's kind of like maxim number four is, is that the way you build out your dilemma combos and stuff should reflect the deck itself too. Like, what is the deck doing? So again, if you're like if you're playing like a very fast, like speed solver deck or whatever, right? Then you want to work with the duels first because they're the ones that are going to be most likely most likely to be encountered by an opponent who's trying to move fast, who's trying to find the weak spots in your game. So you want to make sure your dual combos are, like, really good before you start working on, like, the space combos and stuff because your, your interaction with the opponent isn't necessarily there, you know? But since you're playing a mid-range or an ag aggressive deck, we work with the dual... Oh, sorry, we work with the space and the planet combos first because you want to you want to slot them into wherever it is you think your opponent's going to go first. Okay? Got it. Okay. And then that's... We'll get to that... Um, but that's that's um, kind of max of number five is is that okay when you're in the game with your dilemmas, your dilemmas go based upon what it is that you think your opponent's going to do, and that was what I when I was talking to Joe. I says our last conversation, our last session that I had with Joe was to help him 
like figure out how to learn how to read a space line and then realize, okay, I think my opponent's gonna start here. If they start here, what do I want them to face? Right? What do I want my opponent to face and in what order? Okay? Right. I call it hurting the opponent. Okay? It's something that I don't think many players do. I do it without even thinking about it at this point. I've done it because it's my only way of operating at this point. Okay? And it's, in my personal opinion, it is the reason why I've, like, reached that number one ranking is because of the fact that it's something that I do and I've, like, learned how to do to, like, the maximum ability now. And I don't think that most other players even do it. And the few that do it, no offense to them, I do it better just because I've been doing it longer. Um, mm -hmm. But it's my recommendation for how to get better at, at dilemmas in this game is to learn how to, like, herd the opponent, right? And obviously, if like if you're playing a like you said, you're playing a solver deck, you're playing dilemmas that are trying to hurt your weak you know the the decks that you're potentially weak against. And you're trying to climb, you know, up your percentage chance of beating those decks. Well, then you're crafting combos that hurt that opponent, and then you're trying to figure out where your opponent's going to be. So those are the combos that that opponent faces. Yeah. Okay. And you can't make six combos that hurt everybody because again, that's just not how the game works, right? So you're going to have combos that are good against some opponents, bad against others, and vice versa. So, um, so that leads to max of number what six or seven, which is basically that when you're crafting your combos, you got to take a broad look at them when you're done and say how many combos are strong against certain decks, weak against certain decks, and stuff like that. And you never want to have more than like two combos be weak against a particular type of opponent. Or a particular deck that's probably popular. Okay, someone brings a deck that you weren't anticipating. You, you do you just do the best you can. But you know, for whatever is kind of out there in the meta and stuff like that, you know, like playing against it, playing your dilemmas against a Dominion Slaughter deck is way different than playing your dilemmas against Federation Two Mission Win. Right. Okay. Right. All right. So that leads you, me you, to when you when you say that you say playing dilemmas like the same dilemmas is just a placement different locations. Right. Yeah, so you're right. already looking at that, at that space line. You're already saying, hey, I, this is a Federation deck. I'm thinking the Ferengi deck, whatever it is. And you're thinking through yep. the best, your, your combos and how they're going to face them. And then if you were that opponent, where they can. Right. The, or, or, you know, how, how they're, how they're going to play the game. The, the start, yeah, the starting, po the starting point to that is to basically put yourself in your opponent's shoes and be like, what would I not want to face and where would I not want to face it? Yeah. Okay? Yep. That's, the, that's kind of the... That's the looking at it from the other direction. But you're absolutely right. It's right. Very, very easy just to look at the space of the planet on the space line and go, okay, well, I have a space combo. I find a combo and place it down. To right. Point. Right. Yep. yep. Okay, so, um, so let's move on to your space combos then because this, we've now created a combo where it is, its best position is going to be closest to your six PNZ missions. If your opponent's in another quadrant, you know, then you're kind of figuring out, okay, well, where's the mission I want to have this at? Um, because this is this is a dilemma combo that you'd want them to face first, if possible, because it'll put stress on the few number of people that they have in play, especially with persistent individuality. Yeah. Okay. Like the fewer people they have in play, the less likely they are to have seven different classifications. The less likely they are to have multiple engineers. This dilemma hits harder. It's harder to beat. And then same way with God, it's harder to come up with two guys that have integrity greater than seven earlier in the game. So this is a combo where you're like, okay, I'm either going to put it, if it's an Alpha Quadrant opponent, I want it I want it next to my six PNZ missions. If I'm not playing, in a, if I'm playing an opponent in another Quadrant or as cross, cross Quadrants, I want this to be at whatever mission that they are going to like face first. Because again... Imagine how different our game is, mm -hmm. Matt. If I face this versus what you had, right? Not even, not even close. And it was, uh, so you had Bay Jordan right, yeah, right next to the PNZ. No. And well, yeah. I mean, the Bay Jordan region was next to you, but right. okay. actual Bay Jordan was three slots away. It was a mission. It was the mission, the Bajoran wormhole, and a mission. Away, 
Yeah. Right. So Bajor was as far away from you as it could be. Right. But yeah. the yeah. point being is that like you're going to kill one guy with a persistent individuality, or I'm not even going to cruise through this mission. Like I'm not even going to attempt the mission. Yeah. Right. So like that's kind of what happened in our game was that I'm like okay I got the Bajoran orb and I'm like okay it's a buried alive whatever right you you gave me the free kick out but then I was like eh let's just go right right and so then like yeah, persi- yeah. You, well I was just gonna say so because you you would have actually seen this in that case with that deck and you would have made a decision whether or not to move forward or not right. based off of that right okay got yeah it. so. Say in our game, like, I face that buried alive, I have my orb. I'm like, I can beat a god combo, I can't beat anything in space anyway, I'm just going to put one guy in space, a couple guys on the planet, whatever, right? You would have kept me from beating the combo with the persistent, like, you would have killed the guy in space, it would have been done. And I'm like, okay, I'm kicked out. But now that I see the persistent individuality, I know that I'm beating the god behind it, but you don't let me solve the mission right away. Yeah. Right? And I now have to spend those next couple of turns playing the game normal and finding my seven different classifications or six different classifications and having two engineers right so that i can push through it and then of course i'm going to beat god no matter what but in our game you should not have put this at major period yeah okay like you can't put god which is again this is where like look at your opponent's deck figure out what kind of deck it is and figure out what your weak dilemmas are god is weak against majorans they have lots of guys with integrity greater than seven. Yep. They have orbs that give them bonuses. They have all kinds of things like that. This god combo, like your version of it, this version of it, shouldn't be at major period. Right? It yep. goes back to the, like, you can build your combos, but you have to play your combos to the best of your ability. Or you just take your combos apart. Like, Chris and I do this all the time, which is maxim number eight. Never be afraid to completely blow up all your combos and start over again based upon your opponent. Because, like, if I'm playing an opponent who's playing Borg, I have ones, I have my combo set up, but those combos might be good against everybody but Borg, but I have, like, seven or eight dilemmas in there that are really good against Borg. I'll blow all those combos up. I'll take those eight dilemmas. I will put them at missions one and two of where I think that Borg opponent's going to go, and then I'm just going to be, like, Fine. Everything else is just what it is. Like, if, if my Borg opponent walks through a mission somewhere else, so be it. You know? Yeah. Okay? All right. So we'll set this aside. Now, let's talk about the two Edo probes. I don't like this at all. Okay. Okay? Again, Edo probe against any Borg opponent is a walkthrough. And realistically speaking, a lot of decks will just walk through the first Edo probe because they've got a 10 point loss built into their deck. Yeah. And um, even those that, and, and of course, those decks, they'll take one, they'll never face the other one at the other space combo. Got it. Right? Yeah. Okay. So this is kind of a double whammy problem that you were doing here. You were playing. And of course, Edo Probe is extremely telegraphing. So you're kind of violating rule number, you're, you're violating several of the early rules. You're violating the, like, don't be predictable. Don't be predict- don't, what's that? Don't be predictable. Right? Don't be predictable. Right? Yeah. Edo Probe is just like Buried Alive. You're telegraphing what's coming. So look, so take that in context then, Matt. You had 50% of your combos where the first alum was giving away the farm. Yeah. So that's a problem. Okay, so we're gonna take these Edo probes and we're chucking them. Okay. Okay. All right. Now that being because again, like your best opponent. Now, granted, your best opponent is a Borg deck where they're in the neutral zone with you, <laughs> right? And right. you know, um, and you could potentially shoot them or whatever to get around to get around the corner. Like you saw, you you saw two of your PNZs, you know, and then you whatever. But I mean. Some board decks are going to be your worst matchup, though, because if, like, a tactical cube ends up in your neutral zone with you, you're never solving those space missions. So now you're doubly weak. So we're going to take these Edo probes and we're going to chuck them. Okay? 
Uh, dead end is kind of a dilemma that if you're running eighteen, if you're running eighteen dilemmas, you're just building a combo around it, and it is going at the mi and you're assuming that that's going to be your like combo that goes at whatever mission your opponent's never going to do, or depending on the opponent, like if it's if they're playing an insurrection, a deck with insurrection or whatever, then this is this one's it, it's hard committed to um, whatever mission. Is yeah, like they're, they're yeah, so okay, so for that reason, I don't like dead end in space or planet combos, okay, because okay? you don't want to have that combo committed to something and then be and then be at the wrong type, right? Well, again, you can take your combos and don't be afraid to break them up and reform them as a less experienced player, Matt. I don't want you doing that like all the time yet. You would want to kind of work, you your build your skills up to getting there later on. Early on, you should be like, okay, I, I want to stick my combos. I, I, Or maybe you just like, you swap one dilemma from each of two different combos early on or something like that for whatever. But for the most part, dead ends should really just be in a dual combo. And it's just more or less like, okay, this goes at the least likely mission for them to ever attempt. Or it's committed to like insurrection or something like that. Got it. Okay. You, do you play with dead end or you don't mind it? I play with it a lot, but dead end is quite literally the last dilemma to go into any dilemma. You know, any any group of dilemmas that I put together for a deck. Here's the thing you have to understand about me, man. I'll, I'll say this: is that I play with dead end because I end up playing a lot of decks where I'm doing thirteen or fourteen seed cards. I see. Yeah. And so then I guess here's a so what I like to do is I literally like to have dead end just be by itself and I stick it at whatever mission is the mission they'll never do. Yeah. Yeah. Because it basically this is weird. If I'm going to telegraph something, I want it to provide me with a leverage. If I'm sticking it like at a mission that is their least likely to attempt mission anyway, then I'm leveraging the opponent and I both looking at that one seed card going, that's a dead end, and they go, I'm never walking over there. I'm not going to waste the time. And so I've literally just kept the mission completely out of play with one seed card. Right. Right. Makes sense. Yep. Um, different people feel differently about it. Uh, Chris's style and the style of a lot of other players is they're like, okay, if I'm running 19 seed cards, dead ends a floater. I just, it floats on its own. You just play it wherever you think it's going to be. Most yep. First attempt. Yeah. Yep. To kind of just to basically waste your opponent's time and push them off it and stuff like that. What Dead End is great for is when you're playing a committed battle deck and you want to keep them off their home world. So when we played our game, Matt, that's where the Dead End should have went. You should have pulled the Dead End out of your space combo and just Dead Ended Bajor. Yep. Just assuming that that was going to possibly help you in some way. <laughs> hey, it would have been turn five instead of four. Right. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So we're gonna set dead end aside. We're not gonna we're not chucking it like the Edo probes, but we're gonna set it aside for a moment. And we're gonna just focus on these space combos. You are running you are running six um <clears throat> six universal space missions. So the thing so then this is where I'm like, oh god, Matt, Matt, oh you sweet summer child, I have so much work to do with you. Uh you didn't set these up. Like, you literally, like, dead end into. Like, experience beach into. So then your opponent could walk into it with a, uh, a red shirt ship and lose one guy. And you've wasted all that potential. Right. Kind of like Facey and you need to be able to get people in there. Right. Sure so this is another perfect position for persistent individuality or Thacian powers or Ferengi infestation or, depending on the deck, DNA security scan. Really make them hurt. Just make them hurt, right? Mm -hmm. So then I would say, let's do that. Thacian powers for one of them. And then again, don't be predictable. So then, um, uh, let's see here. This one. Try Lithium Raid. It requires it requires a bunch of something. It requires a bunch of an attribute, and it's and it's dual. So like it's an easy one that 
you know, you can swap it in position in the combo. You can swap its position with another Dilemma from any of your other combos. Um, if you run against a six planet deck, like you're not over committing here, you know what I mean? To just more space dilemmas. You just need something that makes the opponent commit. Yep. Yep. Okay. Got it. Right. So then that's another way to get better at playing dilemmas, Matt, is to understand what every individual combo is doing. And that is that, um, especially right now where the meta is very much like go fast. What you want to do is one, never let the opponent have a micro team do anything more than just see the first dilemma. And two, that first dilemma must make them commit resources to the mission attempt. Yep. Once we start getting into like, once the meta maybe rebalances later on and you're facing a lot of like mid rangey decks, that becomes a lot less necessary, but that's the push and pull of the meta. But I have never really been one for any dilemma combo to start off with. My opponent gets to see it and the next dilemma. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There, there are going to be situations. There are going to be situations where you want to do that, but those are specific to those combos. Like generally, we're talking in generalities here. They're like, okay, we're in a meta right now where, okay, if I'm, you're playing a mid rangey deck, you absolutely cannot let an opponent see two dilemmas with a bare minimum group. Okay. Again, that's going back to the what kind of deck am I playing? What do I not want my opponent to be able to do? Okay. So every one of your combos has to start off with that you need to qualify. And you're sort of doing that over here with the Buried Alive. Yes, they get to see two dilemmas, but you're making you're still making them qualify. Okay. So again, Cytherian, so what we want to do then is the Cytherians will just be behind one of them. Yeah. Okay. And now we can set this one aside because we have a completed combo here that's basically, okay, you need to commit a bunch of people. They need to go away. And then who's ever left is also going to probably go is, you know, they're going to, they're just going to die. Cause like, I mean, you're killing six, you know, right. if it, you know, I mean, most opponents are going to be like, what can I do with the bare minimum? And then that's fine. Right. If you want, I mean, yeah, I mean, depending on how the meta shifts and stuff like that, maybe you kind of flip this around where you start with the Cytherians, you make a ship full of some people go away, right? You make them qualify, but, you know, that's not necessarily the way you want to do it. No, that's a, that's a great combo. Okay. I, I totally see it. Okay. Yeah. So then it becomes, what, what do we want to have the, behind the explosive decompression over here? I'm just a big fan of persistent individuality because then... You'll make them qualify. Um, you'll make them qualify with the least two engineers. Yeah. Those engineers will most likely die, and then persistent individual gets better because now they need now they need to have a bunch of dudes, and then you have at least probably two more of them be more engineers. Cool. Cool. So does that make sense to you? It does. Yeah. No. Totally. Would you would you do another side three behind this other combo? You, you like, but you like persistent independent. Right, to right. Because again, you also the other thing I another and this isn't like a rule, but it's kind of more of like a, a thought. Is that it's kind of a, it's kind of like a it's a commentary on the don't be predictable maxim, right? Yeah. Is that if you're running exact copies of combos or whatever, right, then you're kind of being predictable by default in a sense, but you're not really, right? Um, but at the same time, you're also limiting your flexibility against different opponents. Yeah. Opponents that are going to be good against Cytherians may not necessarily be good against persistent individuality. Cytherians has its weaknesses, which is short space lines. So of any opponent that's on a short space line, Cytherians is not good at it. You don't want to. You don't want to compound your weaknesses, because then what like you, you said it gives you more flexibility for when you need to blow them up. Right, well. right. So, okay. yeah. so like, Cytherians will be really strong against an opponent who's in the alpha quadrant with you. But when you face an opponent that's in an off quadrant, Cytherians is a bad dilemma. And then this combo gets shifted to this goes to the least likely space mission for the opponent to attempt. Got it. And then this other combo becomes your primary like space combo. And again, 
you want to read the opponent's missions and you want to have your best combos in the places where you think your opponent's going to attempt first. Okay? Cool. Okay, so that gives us a planet, two spaces. And then, it, then again, like if you want to do two planets, if you want to do three duels, it's entirely your call. I'm a big believer in the two, two, and two because of the fact that, you know, the, and the only time I get away from that is if I really do feel like the opponent, you know, opponents are going to be like, oh, six planets and six spaces are a thing. What I like to do to hedge that is that I then like to not have any more than, you know, a few of that particular type of dilemma in those combos. Yep. Generally speaking, though, most opponents right now are just like, they're running three and three, or they're running four and two, and you're not going to have a problem. You're just only going to be the randomly rare opponent that's going to be like, I'm running six PNZs, like you are. Yeah. Who would do that? Right. Yeah. Okay. And then it becomes a question of just learning how to, at that point, you're breaking up all your combos, you're reforming them, and you're quite literally giving up missions then, but you're going to like, you're going to figure out, you're just going to take a guess, like, what is the mission that I don't think they're going to attempt? You know, and like in our game, Matt, I'm like, my deck is a go fast deck anyway. So, like, if I just pick correctly that you just don't put, if you just don't attempt that mission, like, you know, I'm also going fast. So, there's always that too. So, all right. So, let's make another planet combo. Okay. Okay. And let's do it with the fact that we've got, okay, we're, we're, we're doing a buried alive combo over here. Because we have buried alive, we know that if we face a six planet deck, we can put three of these dilemmas underneath it. And then we just have two dilemmas that are just bad and we're gonna be okay. So you really only have, against a six planet deck, you only have like two bad dilemmas, right? Okay. All right, let me reform, let me do, let me do this where we're, we're consistent here, okay. Okay, so um, using what you have here, just taking a look at it, I, I don't like Forsaken. Uh, these two dilemmas are good. This dilemma is good. Higher the fewer is a question mark. Um, lack of preparation is okay. And then your other combo over here is perfectly fine. I do right. like... I, I will say I do like this as a as a combo. Um, I like that you're qualifying with a minion. I like that you are uh, getting a choice kill. Um, the only problem is linguistic is probably not necessarily the one. Like I mean, friendly fire is probably better because then they have to have three leadership or three security, and it all has to be on non-humans. So I would think that instead of linguistic, you'd want to just basically go with a friendly fire then instead. Yep. So we just kind of like went ahead and made a, a dual combo here based upon what we're seeing, what we're working with, right? Yep. Okay. And we can chuck the linguistic aside. Yep. Uh, we're chucking the space amoeba. Um, friendly fire is one of those dilemmas that it's like, okay... It doesn't do enough work, even against the opponents where you would think it's good. Chris really likes it as a 19th or a 20th dilemma, and I can buy into that really easily. Because when we're talking 19th and 20th dilemmas, it pairs perfectly with your other like 19th and 20th dilemma. Right. So I kind of am like, okay, we're going to set these two aside together. Got it. Right. Experience beige is, is a good dilemma. We're going to just take this Forsaken and set it aside. Not that it's a terrible dilemma, but it's just, honestly, it's not doing enough for you. Yep. Okay. And this is that's more a commentary on the fact that, again, I don't... I really feel like the designers and, and whatever, they need to be really working on, like, you know... There, it's just a reality of this game that there are only so many slots in your deck for dilemmas. And there are just, realistically speaking, way too many dilemmas that suck and we'll just never see play. Yeah. And that's yeah. kind of a, and in my opinion, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an element of this game that design can figure out 
very easily how to not make it that way, and they sort of did. They made dilemmas that download other dilemmas. And they just yeah. haven't pushed into that enough. There yeah, are... Some of that's dumb. Uh, we, we, they, they, some of those older dilemmas, right, where you can get a seed card and, and you double their you, their, uh, their value, mm -hmm. you know, from some of those. They, that, that seems to have been successful. I mean, maybe there's a mechanism for that or... Right. or I think some of the redo of it, the Q flash, you know, yep. made, made that a little better. All, all of that seems to be achievable. I agree with you. Otherwise, it's just bond your father. Right, right. So we're gonna set forsaken aside because it's just one of those dilemmas that, like, it just doesn't do enough, and therefore will never really be a very usable dilemma unless they figure out, unless design wants to commit to making it better. All right. Now, it's just the reality of every card game. Like, not every card is a winning card, right? But, I mean, we we have a player, we have a player's committee, we have total control over this game, and to sit, and to, like, let these kind of bad cards languish like this, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a venial sin, in my opinion. <laughs> All right. Experience Beach is a good card, um, but it's a hurting, your, it, it's a, it's a great hurting your opponent card. But since you're running mid range, you're not running like a true. You're not running like a true harassing battle deck or something like that. Um, right. It's not really necessarily strong enough. Experience Beach is also really good if you're like I am in a heavily speed on speed meta, and it's a razor's edge between you and a lot of other decks. Then it's a good card. The issue yeah. with Beach is is that a lot of decks, the fast decks now, they are so fast that they're like they're not even committing everyone to a mission attempt or whatever, right? So they're like, okay, I go in with these, like, eight people. These eight people are all really good. They'll get down, they'll drill down to the experience beach, or they'll face it right away, and they will still be able to, on that same turn, do another mission and make the beach go away. Wow. So wow. beach is just not well positioned right now, and it's not right for your deck. Okay. Okay. Um, so that leaves us with these. Lack of preparation is definitively like a call uh, on the meta. It's a call on uh, what your deck is trying to do for sure. It's just like with Experience Beach, it's a, it's kind of a it's a meta card. It is not technically on its own merits a great dilemma. Mm -hmm. But that being said, you know, in a meta where things can possibly be on a razor's edge, or you want to make your opponent kind of be out in the open on something like a battle deck or whatever, it becomes a great card. So, like, you're using, you, you tried to use cards, Matt, that were, like, great if you were way more committed to battle. But you're yeah. not yeah. really committed to it. Yeah. So, lack of preparation is one of those. We're going to hold that one aside. It's going to go up here with these other ones. Uh, so then we've got these here. Um, quite literally, these can form a combo of just, I mean, you can put it whatever order you want. You can shuffle them up and throw them underneath. <laughs> like, not, neither you nor your opponent knows what's going to happen over here because each of these is kind of good on their own. Dilemmas that both kill or stop and then wall are good. Because they make your opponent lose a resource of some kind, and then they also make them qualify. So what I would say is if we wanted just to keep these three as a combo, is um, what they can be, what they can be is they can be your dual combo that you want to have, because especially because of the female's love interest garbage scow, you want to maybe have them be like the combo that your opponent's possibly going to face next to your planet combo over here. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, so there we go. We've, I mean, and this is perfectly fine. Like, you can just put these in any order that you want. It's, it's, it's perfectly acceptable to have a combo like this because of the fact that um, you, you just can't make... And you have to have dual combos, and dual dilemmas are, generally speaking, slightly weaker, and they're certainly not... And even the good one, the good ones are good, but they, they don't hammer like a V'ger hammers. They don't hammer like a god can hammer. You know what I mean? Right, right. So again, we're kind of left with coming up with a planet combo here. And so yeah. we kind of go back to what is it that your deck is? What is it that you're trying to do? How are you trying to herd your opponent? 
And, and yeah. yeah. So give me your thoughts, and then I'll, I'll work off of that. Yeah, I, I mean, the, I think it's, I have to complete three three missions in this. So I, it's either, I think the thought process between, you know, some of these, some of these other ones, the experience of the beach, or the, or the dead end, or the, the higher the fewer, or the lack of preparation was either bleed points, right? So mm -hmm. it, again, it's kind of more time, right. time frame involved, or stop and go on to the next mission. It, it's, it's, most, it's mostly, it was mostly to try and buy time. Right to, to be able to complete the other the, the three full missions that you need as part of the space, and then hope your opponent wasn't as prepared in terms of you know having two two full planet you know planet mission things that you can just kind of burn through really quickly. That was that was a thought process. Right. Okay. I I I always tell my acolytes and stuff that you know. I also don't want to like pigeonhole you into playing dilemmas the same way that I play them because if you do that, then you kind of become predictable. I have made it clear that I'm like, ju I, I, I never play the same dilemma combos in a row, period. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I don't play the same deck two tournaments in a row, you know two tournaments in a row or two events in a row, and therefore by necessity I am not playing the same dilemmas. Because I'm playing two different decks, and they should have, they will have two different like attack plans. They have two different clocks on them. They have two different um, strategies. They have two. They have different weaknesses to different opponents. And so, um, that's kind of like I said. You, you don't want to be predictable. Um, yeah. Uh, I like what you're saying about okay. Well, if you know that you have to do three missions in order to win, you need to find a way to slow your opponent down enough to be able to do so. The problem is though, is a point drain doesn't affect Borg, mm -hmm. and Borg is going to be a very bad matchup for you. So my opinion is is that I, since, I, since we've identified that Borg is a tough to bad matchup for you, um, that this might be the situation where you're okay actually running two of the same dilemma. Because it is going to do for you what it is that you want it to do, which is potentially blow up a board cube, make an opponent be out in the open with a ship, etc., etc. So this would be the rare situation where I'd say, okay, maybe you do want to have two different god combos, but we're going to approach them differently. Okay. Okay. So we'll make another copy of God out here. Whoops. Um, but since your your kind of battle though is kind of shippy battle and stuff, right? So you still got to try to maybe like force a ship to be there. But the problem is always you already got a buried alive. Can't use another crisis. Same problem. Tends to telegraph things. So the only real way to do that would be to like plan on this this of the two of them being also like towards the end of a space line if possible because then it's less it's more likely they had to fly to get to it so like this combo then is like okay i'm planning on this combo not being where i think the opponent's going to start also yeah. okay yeah. so re regardless of what we do with this we're assuming that this combo, and we can do this because of the fact that you're running six P and Zs, your opponent will always be like six across the board next to you. Uh, we'll assume that you're to the to, to to the open side of the god combos here. That's where you are, hypothetically. Mm -hmm. So we put this god combo here at this planet, assuming that this is a planet. If it's not a planet and it's a space, then we would just go ahead and have. Um, the persistent individuality combo be there, or one of these dual combos. Um, I kind of like this one being there because they have to then have a ship there and they gotta tow that scow. Yeah. Okay. So then we put, then we'll assume that we put this combo here. So statistically speaking, an opponent's gonna have a planet over here on this end. Right. So we're going to assume then that what's, we're going to put this god on this end. OK. 
Okay, and then that leaves us with, generally speaking, a st highly statistical probability that we can do this. If your opponent has to have, only has two spaces, well then we, we have to live with one of them. And what we can do is we will just plan on the Scytherians combo going there because you will always have six missions to their left with higher span than them. They still have to go into you. Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna assume worst case scenario, which is another thing that I like to do when I'm thinking decks through, is I go, what's my worst case scenario? That's a worst case scenario. And so then we can just kind of go, okay, so they only have two spaces, so one of them's over here probably. Where does the other one go? Most likely in the middle of the space line. That's fine, this is a strong combo. Let's assume it goes to the middle of the space line. We wanna put this garbage scow combo in the middle, right? Towards the middle if we can, so they can't just put the scow onto your mission. Right. It also holds their ship up while being somewhat nearby to you. And that pushes these combos in off to the right, just like this. So we can assume then that a lot of opponent, opponents are not going to put their outposts. They're, gonna, they're not going to start on their end of the space line. They're going to have to fly a ship to get to that planet, most likely. So we're set up that way with God. We don't need to force the ship there. So you can do whatever the heck you want to do in front of that God. Um, not very alive in space in the Just, yeah. <laughs> just not that. Um, so you could... There's just, and then this is where I just gotta kind of leave it. You can do whatever the heck you want to do in front of it. I would just once again, like this is the situation where, because you're planning on this being on the end of a space line, you don't necessarily have to worry about making. This is one of those situations you don't gotta necessarily make them commit or like be like okay, uh, no, like you, you know just the the anti micro teaming or whatever. Right? right, you can probably let them through. But God doesn't have to be at the back of your combo for this then. Fair? That's a good point. No, for sure. Okay. Yeah. So we can do this. And then you can find whatever wall you want to put behind the God that a stranded away team can't necessarily beat. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, then it's just whatever you want to do. Beyond that, I don't care. I mean, you can, this might be a good spot for the dead end then. I don't know. If they're doing this, if they're doing this mission last, or whatever, right? You might be in trouble anyway. Right. Right. So it yeah. just kind of be, kind of becomes a question of: Do you want a dead end here, or do you want like an actual like qualifying wall? Do you have the ability I probably, to? Probably, I probably would have qualified it. I probably wouldn't. Have, was it, to your point earlier, mm -hmm. right? It's it's if it's at the end of the space line like that, it's unlikely to be attempted first. And, uh -huh. Yeah, so you probably do not the dead end. You mm -hmm. do another part. Yeah, got it. Right there, you go. You're, you're thinking it. You're thinking maybe. it through now. Yeah, maybe you put a. Um, well, maybe you put a crisis after the god. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you absolutely wanted to, um, this. Could potentially be a spot for an Edo probe, um, well, because of the fact that if they abandon it and go do something else, you're okay with that. It was on the end of a space line that might be a pain for them. If they push through, you just you kind of hope to slash assume that the god's going to connect, and you're going to make them lose a ship and the points. So, and then, like I said, this last one over here, once you get to the last one, it becomes more about what do you think is going to be the most important thing? Slash, what are your, who are you weak against still? Things like that. Awesome. Okay. 
impressive. Right. Wow. Kevin, you're amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Wow. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna do an outro here, Matt, and stop the recording, and then you and I will continue talking. I saw this is the longest I want to have this video be. So, thank you everyone who's stuck with us to this point for watching. I hope that you've enjoyed this video. I had seen on the uh, Facebook group uh, earlier today that there was at least one or two people that were asking about dilemmas and dilemma combos. So I hope that you are watching this video and you are gaining as much from this as I hope Matt has been. Thank you so much for watching. May the prophets be with you.